Thank you very much. That concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagement to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Can the First Minister confirm whether the Scottish Government has made contact with the European Commission in recent weeks over delays to this year's farm payments? First Minister. There are regular discussions uh, with the European Commission about uh, matters relating to the common agricultural policy um, and agriculture policy in general, but the Government is extremely focused, led by Fergus Ewing, on making sure that payments are made and that in the meantime there is a loan scheme available for farmers to ensure that we are taking care of their uh, cash flow issues. Ruth Davison. Not quite an answer that I was uh, to the question I asked. So let me be a little bit more specific in the question that I put to the First Minister. As the First Minister knows, the deadline for processing the next batch of payments is just eight days from now. As she also knows, if the Scottish Government does not meet that deadline, it faces potentially millions of pounds worth of fines on top of those already incurred, and farmers and crofters face yet more delays. Her ministers have simply dodged this question yesterday and they dodged it last week as well. So let me ask her, is the Scottish Government going to meet that deadline? And if not, does she intend to ask the European Commission for an extension? We First will Minister. continue to operate on the base, same basis that we did last year. We will endeavour to make payments on time and we will continue to discuss with the European Commission any contingency arrangements that we uh, consider are uh, required. Uh, and good progress is being made on making payments, both in terms of the 2015 round uh, and also now in terms of the 2016 round. And what we've done again this year, as we did last year, is make sure that we have loan arrangements in place so that the cash flow concerns of farmers are catered for. Um, that, of course, has all been uh, explored by Audit Scotland uh, in its most recent report as well as in its uh, last report. And the issue of penalties, uh, which was covered in both of these Audit Scotland reports, um, and this was referred to by Fergus Ewing, I think, in the Chamber last week. Uh, the Audit Scotland report last year made uh, certain statements about the risk of penalties. These penalties uh, did not materialise to the extent that Audit Scotland uh, warned last year, and this year it continues to be speculative. So we will continue to work hard to deliver uh, this system. And of course, the big risk uh, to the common agricultural policy, of course, is Brexit, which is being presided over by the Tories. <laughs> Ruth Davison. Well, now we know why Fergus Ewing was dodging it yesterday. Now we know why she's waffling about it today. She was refusing to answer a question, one, about whether her government has already made representations to the European Commission about whether she's going to need to ask for an extension, nor is she answering about a question about whether that extension is going to need to be asked for. And I think that Scotland's rural communities, and I think this parliament, after having been asked a number of times, deserves to have that answer. And the question is really simple, and it's a yes or no question. So let us take you through it again, step by step by step. There are eight days to go. Is the Scottish Government preparing to ask the European Commission to extend the deadline on farm payments because, once again, it has failed to get its act in order and deliver them on time? Now, that is a yes or no answer. Can I have a yes or a no for Scotland's farmers? Yes. What, we are, First Minister. what we are working on in terms of meeting the 30th of June regulatory deadline is uh, working hard to pr process the remaining payments. We've been dealing with a small number of known defects that have been holding up some claims, and these are now being progressed. So that is the position of the Scottish Government. We're working to meet that deadline, and we will continue to do so each and every day until that deadline. Well, I think with the inability to answer a question, I think everyone in this chamber can assume the answer is yes. Everyone in the press gallery can assume that the answer is yes. And everyone that runs a farm in Scotland can assume the answer is yes. And here are the facts. £178 million pounds of taxpayers' money spent on an IT system that still doesn't work. Farmers still waiting on payments from last year. Average incomes in 2016 down to £12,600, cut in half compared to the previous year, a massive knock-on effect for the wider rural community. And for this year, with just over one week to go until the deadline, there are 6,000 applications that are still to be processed, which is a third of the entire total for Scotland. Now, at the start of the year, Nicola Sturgeon spoke directly to farmers at the NFU conference, and she said, we understand the difficulties the late payments caused to you last year. 
We apologise for those difficulties. We are determined not to repeat them. Another promise broken. Why should rural Scotland ever trust you again? First Minister. Well, that's exactly what we are doing. You know, look at 2015 cap pillar one payments, 342 million pounds of payment complete uh, by the deadline. We continue to work to deliver uh, this year's uh, 2016 payments. Uh, 13,100 farmers have received payments in 2016 worth 268 million pounds. We continue to deliver this scheme and we continue to deliver it and seek to deliver it by the deadlines. And of course, what we've done uh, which was a commitment I gave uh, directly to farmers, was put in place loan schemes so that farmers did get the cash that they depend on. So we will continue uh, to deliver this scheme. We will continue to work hard to rectify any problems in the IT system. And we will also continue uh, to argue for the protection of common agricultural payments in the long term. Because I say again, the long term risk to these payments is the reckless Brexit being carried out by the Tories, which threatens to take away all support from our farmers in the longer term. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week. First Minister. Engagement is to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. This week, the SNP unveiled plans to cut taxes for wealthy air travellers and voted to cut off puppy dog tails. Now Audit Scotland has revealed the scale of cuts to our colleges, with full-time student numbers at the lowest level since 2007. There are almost 160,000 fewer students in Scotland's colleges today than there were when the SNP first came to power. This SNP government has cut courses, slashed student support and botched a pay deal for staff. So can the First Minister tell us why any college student or any college lecturer should believe education is her top priority. First well, Minister. I'm glad, I'm glad that Kezia Dugdale has raised the Audit Scotland report on Scottish colleges today. Uh, I welcome that report. It gives me the opportunity to tell the Chamber what the headline findings of that report are, because, not surprisingly, Kezia Dugdale will not want to share them with the Chamber or the Scottish public. What the report finds is that colleges have exceeded the national target for learning in every year since that target was set. The overall percentage of full-time equivalent students successfully completing their course increased from the last year. Most students continue to be satisfied with their college experience. More than 80% of students who achieve a qualification go on to further study, training or employment. We have maintained the full-time equivalent numbers of students above our target. Uh, we see funding for colleges increasing over the two-year period. Staffing numbers in colleges has gone up by 6% in the last two years. In other words, our college sector is delivering well, despite the efforts of Kezia Dugdale to talk it down as she talks down everything else in Scotland. All right, order. 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 It's a week away from recess. Members, please, the election is over. The members, please conduct themselves respons responsibly. Kezia Dugdale. President Officer, if she thinks that's a good report, it shows you just how out of touch with reality she really is. And this matters because colleges are the engine of our economy. For many people, they are a second chance in education or the first chance that they never had. But even if a young person does make it to college under the SNP, far too many don't complete their course. We can reveal today that the number of students dropping out of further education has more than doubled since 2011. It's now the equivalent of 12 people dropping out every single day. How many of them does the First Minister take responsibility for? First Minister. Sure. I, I'm not sure if Kezia Dugdale has actually read the Audit Scotland report. I'm prepared to pass it over so that she can actually have a proper look at it. One of the key findings, one of the earliest findings here, is that the percentage of full-time equivalent students successfully completing their course actually increased in the last year, according to Audit Scotland. So what we have are colleges exceeding the national target for learning. 
more full-time equivalent students successfully completing their course, the vast majority of students saying they're satisfied with their college experience and more than 80% leaving college with a qualification and going into further study, training or employment. And of course, we have one of the lowest rates of youth unemployment in this country anywhere in Europe. That is the reality. We're seeing government funding for colleges increase, something confirmed by the Audit Scotland report. We're seeing the numbers of staff working in our colleges going up, something confirmed by the Audit Scotland report. The Audit Scotland report makes a number of recommendations and work is already underway on each and every one of them. So I know the pressures that people in our public services uh, work under. That's why I'm glad earlier this week there was agreement reached between the unions uh, and college employers to get the first instalment of the pay rise paid to college lecturers who work so hard but despite these pressures, our college lecturers and our students are performing and well. And for once in her life, it might actually be welcome to hear Kezia Dugdale acknowledge the performance of our colleges across the country. Can I ask members behind the leaders to stop, have conversations whether the First Minister is answering questions? Kezia Dugdale. There we have it, President Officer. Nicola Sturgeon's idea of success. 160,000 fewer people going to our colleges and 12 people dropping out every single day. A sacred responsibility. That is how this First Minister described her responsibility to every young person in our country. Well, they are being held back by our First Minister. It is harder to get into college under the SNP, and if you get in, it is even harder to stay there. It is getting harder and harder to believe a word that comes out of her mouth. Sacred responsibility, top priority, meaningless words from a First Minister nobody believes anymore. Isn't it the case that under the SNP, our colleges are simply expendable? You see, First Minister. The problem for Kezia Dugdale's floundering series of questions here is that that's not what the Audit Scotland report says in any uh, way whatsoever. Now, this also might be uncomfortable for Kezia Dugdale. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure it's uncomfortable for Kezia Dugdale. But we made manifesto commitments to maintain the numbers of full-time equivalent students in our colleges. And we have done that. That is confirmed by official statistics. More than 116,000 in every year since we set that target. We also see when unincorporated college places are taken into account, the numbers, headcount numbers are increasing as well. But the reason we made that commitment to full-time equivalent places is because we wanted to see more people going to college, getting a recognised qualification so that it would increase their chances of getting employment. So now, today, 97% of learning hours are delivered on courses that lead to a recognised qualification. That is a good thing. But we still provide courses for people who want part-time opportunities. So the majority of total enrolments at college are still on part-time courses, providing these opportunities for people who need them. So the fact of the matter is, and this is borne out in our employment figures, our positive destination figures, the proof of the pudding, I would say to Kezia Dugdale, is in the eating. We've got more people going on to further study, into further training or employment, and we've got, I think, the third lowest youth unemployment rate in the whole of the European Union. That's actually good news, and for once in her life, could Kezia Dugdale not just bring herself to admit it? Mr Dugdale again, but can I just ask Mr Johnson and Mr Kelly please to keep yeah. the noise down? Kezia Dugdale. I, know, sir, I have read the report and I suspect that the First Minister hasn't, so let me put a question to her so she can prove it one way or another. Does the Audit Scotland rep uh, report confirm that the number of full-time equivalent students is falling this year for the first time? First Minister. Uh, funding Council statistics, we don't, accept, we don't agree with the methodology. Scottish Funding Council statistics, what it is there, it's even in big print. It's even in big print on page eight. Colleges have exceeded the national target for learning. Full-time equivalent places are being maintained. Headcount numbers, and Audit Scotland report does acknowledge this. When you take account of all colleges across the country, headcount places are going up. So the fact of the matter is, on whatever measure we look at, our college sector, yes, is performing under pressure, but is performing exceptionally well. And no matter 
how much Kezia Dugdale grasps around trying to find the bad news to hammer the SNP, she will not succeed in talking down our colleges or talking down Scotland. Thank you. Just one constituency supplementary today from Liam Kerr. A very grateful, President Officer. NHS Tayside announced six months ago it was temporarily shutting the Mulberry unit at Stracathro Hospital, which is a vital and much respected mental health unit. They have this week announced it is almost certain to be permanently closed, which looks like an attempt to shut services on the sly, and it, treat, it treats the patients of Tayside with contempt. Can the First Minister tell us when did the Health Board really decide to permanently shut the unit, and when did her officials become aware? First Minister. Well, firstly, this is about ensuring that services are safe and sustainable, and that is, I think, the first duty of any health board anywhere in the country. What we'd be letting patients down is to have services that are not uh, safe for them. Uh, NHS Tayside has consulted on this issue, and as I understand it, is currently looking uh, at proposals and will bring forward their conclusions in due course. I'd be uh, more than happy to ask the Health Secretary to discuss further with the member if he's got any further information at this stage that he wants, but this is a matter for NHS Tayside to reach conclusions on in due course. Question number three, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. The police officers who serve us in Scotland are under huge pressure. But four years after our police was centralised, there is still turmoil with the Chief Inspector of Constabulary identifying fundamental weakness and dysfunction in his latest report published today. The Chairman of the Scottish Police Authority has resigned. That's three resignations in just four years. Can the First Minister guarantee that the turmoil will now end? And can she tell me whether anyone else is to go? First Minister. Well, firstly, I uh, welcome uh, Her Majesty's Inspectorate report, which uh, was published yesterday. Of course, it was the Justice Secretary who asked Her Majesty's Inspectorate to bring forward this aspect of his review of SPA on an accelerated uh, timescale. I think it is important uh, to recognise what uh, is noted at paragraph four uh, of this report. Uh, there have been positive signs of improvement in SPA board operations over the past 18 months. The relationships between the SPA and Police Scotland have improved significantly and the shared development of Policing 2026 has been a major Milestone, he points to other developments, including improved financial reporting, investment and change management, governance of call handling, and the implementation of board and committee uh, work plans, and cites these as evidence of good progress. Uh, there's also a strong commitment from all members of the board uh, to support policing and drive improvement. It is true to say uh, that the report also uh, makes comment on practices that Her Majesty's Inspectorate uh, found unsatisfactory, uh, issues that have been discussed in uh, committees of this parliament and in this chamber around holding committee meetings in private and not publishing board papers timorously. Uh, these recommendations that are included in this report, of course, are already being acted upon. And of course, action will be taken uh, to recruit a new chair of the Scottish Police Authority as quickly as possible. Willie Rennie. It was interesting that the First Minister couldn't tell me whether the turmoil was about to end and whether anyone else is due to go. So I'd be appreciate an answer to that exactly. in her second answer. And the Chief Inspector did choose his words very carefully. He said there was fundamental weakness and dysfunction. This is her legislation. It's her board appointees and her chairman. So she cannot wash her hands of it now. Call centres, the M9 crash, stop and search, backfilling of civilian jobs, IT programme collapse, failed audit after failed audit on finance. That's all just in four years. Our police officers and staff deserve better. They cannot go on year after year facing these barriers to their good work. In those circumstances, is it really wise of her to merge British Transport Police into this organisation as she proposes to do next week? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
First Minister. Well, firstly, I, I think anybody listening to my first answer would not have heard uh, me trying to wash my hands of anything. Uh, on the contrary, the report that we are talking about today was requested by the Scottish Government. The uh, Cabinet Secretary for Justice specifically asked Her Majesty's Inspector to bring forward uh, this aspect of his review uh, more quickly than other aspects of it. Uh, and there is a recognition of uh, the aspects that have been found unsatisfactory. So action has already been taken, for example, around uh, the transparency of board meetings uh, and uh, board papers. Uh, action on these recommendations are underway. Uh, the uh, Scottish Police Authority has been asked to put forward an action plan covering all of these recommendations. It will do that and there will be follow-up work uh, by Her Majesty's inspectors. Uh, but, you know, on... And, you know, I... Asking me if I can stand here in Parliament and say that nobody else will ever leave the employment of the Scottish Police Authority, of course I cannot say that. But the focus we are uh, having right now is on making sure that the Police Authority is functioning the way people want it to function. Uh, the, there is a welcome in this report, of course, for the action the Cabinet Secretary announced last week to review how the executive of the SPA supports the board. And that is specifically welcomed by uh, the inspector in his report. But I also think it's really important to recognise uh, what I read out in my first answer, uh, the recognition of the real improvements that have been made. Uh, and finally, on the issue of the uh, British Transport Police. British Transport Police play a hugely valuable uh, role in keeping a railway safe, and we will ensure that railway policing uh, is always uh, strong and accountable to the people of Scotland. But the reasons uh, for integration are to improve the way uh, that our policing operates in a coherent and joined up fashion. And I have to say, some of what I have witnessed uh, in recent times in terms of the police response uh, to some of the awful terrorist attacks we've seen has shown that that kind of coordination is to the benefit not just of the police, but the public across Scotland as well. Number of supplementaries. The first from Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister for a response to this Queen's speech, and in particular the confirmation that the UK Government is planning a power grab over new Brexit powers. First Minister. Uh, well, there's not much in the Queen's speech to respond to, it, it's fair to say. I mean, what a humiliatingly uh, vacuous uh, Queen's speech that was, that was, was published yesterday. Um, clearly, the Tories at Westminster have given up entirely on the day job uh, beyond any doubt. All, all that was in the Queen's speech uh, were damaging plans to rip the UK not just out of the EU but out of the single market. That is what the Tory government now amounts to. Uh, perpetrating that economic destruction uh, upon everybody across the UK. Uh, Claire Adamson asked specifically about a power grab. I remain extremely concerned about uh, what appear to be plans to centralise power in the hands of uh, Whitehall as powers come back from Brussels. And I'm also concerned that despite the hints we got yesterday, there is still no clear and emphatic acceptance on the part of the UK government uh, that the repeal bill will require the legislative consent of this parliament. It is unthinkable that anything else would be the case. So maybe the Tories could just confirm that and stop prevaricating on it. But the last point I would make, presiding officer, uh, in relation to the Westminster government's programme is this, and this is a serious point that the Tories would do well not to laugh at, as they usually do when these things are raised. This morning in the High Court in England, the Tory benefit cap has been declared illegal and discriminatory against single parents and children. The judge, the judge in that case has said that the benefit cap is causing real misery uh, to no good purpose. That is a damning indictment of a callous and uncaring Tory government. No, no doubt that's why it's in the state it's in. Ross Greer. Thank you, President Officer. Last week, the Scottish Government published its education governance proposals. In its own documents, they acknowledged the widespread support for the current governance arrangements and strong opposition to their own proposals. So why is the Scottish Government proposing changes that only the Conservative Party seem to support? First Minister. Well, we're proposing changes that we believe are in the interests of uh, parents, teachers and pupils 
across our country. At the heart of the governance uh, review that the Deputy First Minister published in this chamber last week is a simple proposition. We want to get more powers and more resources into the hands of schools and of head teachers, uh, because there is evidence that when that happens and we improve the quality of learning in the classroom, standards improve. So we'll continue to press on with our reform programme, uh, governance reforms, the national improvement framework, the attainment challenge and the attainment fund, the pupil equity fund, getting more resources into the hands of head teachers. And I would call on everybody across the chamber uh, to engage and continue to engage rather in this debate and get behind these plans because they are in the interests of pupils. Graham Day. Thank you, President Officer. The uncertainty around Brexit is already impacting significantly on the UK soft fruit sector, with remote reports emerging of EU worker shortages. And Angus Growers from my constituency were on national radio this morning, once again highlighting their concerns over where this is headed. Can the First Minister outline what can be and is being done here in Scotland to help support this important industry? First Minister. Well, can I thank Graeme Day uh, for his question, which I know is a significant uh, concern in his uh, constituency. Uh, we will continue to do everything we can to support the soft fruit uh, grower uh, sector and make sure that the concerns they have that are particular to Brexit are communicated very forcibly uh, to the UK government. Um, obviously, this is a particular concern uh, to that particular sector of our economy. Uh, but I've been struck just in the last couple of weeks, uh, I've done uh, in this week alone, two separate roundtable uh, discussions with business interests, another one uh, last week. And I have been struck uh, by how often now the concern about access to skills is being raised by businesses across our country. Uh, many businesses uh, face skills challenges, which we are working to support them with, but there is a growing concern that Brexit and the reckless approach to Brexit that has been taken now by this chaotic uh, Tory government at Westminster is going to make their jobs even harder and put a lot of their businesses at risk. And that is another reason why common sense must prevail and we must all unite. And I hope we could unite as this parliament to demand that we keep our place in the single market and continue to ensure that our businesses can access the skills that they so badly need. And Neil Bibby. The terror, level, uh, terror threat level is at severe. Transport hubs are a target. The Scottish Police Authority is in disarray. And next week, the government wants to pass a bill to merge the British Transport Police into Police Scotland. Train companies oppose, and rail unions have even threatened strike action over a merger that simply workers do not want and passengers do not need. This week, the British Transport Police Federation called for the bill to be suspended and questioned, and I quote, whether it's right that this integration continues while transport hubs and the country's infrastructure is at such risk from terrorism. They suggest it is not. Our British transport police officers do a fantastic job to protect the public. The question for the First Minister is will she listen to our police officers and drop this bill or will she press on regardless and ignore these serious warnings from our police officers? First Minister. Look. These are serious issues and you know, we've listened very closely to the issues that have been raised by uh, the rail industry, the police and unions. We've given guarantees uh, in particular to unions around uh, jobs, pay and, and pension conditions. Uh, but integration here is about providing a single command structure for policing in Scotland so that there is access to wider support facilities and specialist resources, which include Police Scotland's counter-terrorism capabilities. When we've seen an increase in armed police response in response to recent events, for example, at transport hubs, that is an armed police response that is not provided by British Transport Police. It is a response provided by Police Scotland. So it's not about undermining the functions that the British Transport Police provide. They do an excellent response. It's about making sure that there is a unified command structure, that there is more access to specialist resources and that our police service works in that joined up coordinated way. We will continue to talk to all those with a concern about this to seek to reassure them. Uh, but I actually think that what we've seen in recent weeks uh, highlights the, the reasons for uh, integration uh, rather than takes away from those reasons. Question number four, John McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what recent discussions have been held between the Scottish Government and the Scotland Office regarding opportunities for future intergovernmental cooperation and the new UK ministerial appointments. First Minister. Uh, well, there's regular contact between the Scottish Government uh, and the UK Government, uh, including the Scotland Office, to ensure that day-to-day -day business uh, continues after the general election. Uh, we stand ready to engage actively with the UK Government in order to protect our interests in Europe, and we will continue to insist that the devolved administrations are fully involved in the development of the UK's negotiating position. 
June McAlpine. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Would the First Minister agree that the correct way to ensure Scotland is represented in Brexit negotiations is for the democratically elected Scottish Government to join the talks, not unelected peers defeated at the ballot box? Yeah. First Minister. Yeah. Well, I think we've seen uh, democracy Tory style uh, in full. Uh, action uh, this week. I mean, you know, what I'm about to see here is not personal in any way against the individual concerned. But isn't it absolutely outrageous that we have a candidate uh, defeated at the ballot box, fairly and squarely in an election, and then a matter of days later, uh, the wishes of the people of Perth and North Persia are completely disregarded. This failed candidate is put into the House of Lords and installed as a minister in the Scotland office, elected by absolutely nobody anywhere in Scotland. It is an absolute abomination and shows what contempt the Tories have for democracy. The way to involve Scotland in these Brexit talks is to do what Ruth Davidson used to call for before she was told the error of her ways by her bosses at Westminster, is have the democratically elected Scottish government at the negotiating table. When is Ruth Davidson going to start arguing for that again? Or is that something she's just been told she's not allowed to say anymore because it doesn't suit her bosses in Westminster? Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. The First Minister will recognise the important role of this parliament in scrutinising intergovernmental cooperation, not least in this field. Can she therefore tell us today what actual proposals her government has put or will put to the UK government in relation to the negotiation of Article 50, a process which has already begun? First Minister. Well, Lewis Macdonald, of course, will be well aware of Scotland's place in Europe, the substantial document that we published in December of last year, setting out in some detail uh, how and why we think the UK should stay within the single market. If that doesn't happen, how and why we think Scotland should be able to stay within the single market and setting out in detail uh, across a range of different issues the powers that we think should lie with this parliament in order to protect our interests. We will also continue, as we have been doing, to make specific proposals to the UK government uh, on a whole range of issues, like the one I was talking about earlier on, the uh, constraints of uh, getting rid of freedom of movement to our businesses and accessing skills uh, through to the impact on our agriculture sector uh, by taking away uh, payments through the common agricultural policy through to the real fears many have about our fishing industry being sold out uh, by the Tories. So we will continue to make all of these arguments. But do you know what? It would be, I think, better if we had two things, that this parliament united to demand of the UK government. First, that this parliament will be properly consulted through the formal legislative consent process. And secondly, that this Scottish government, democratically elected, has a seat at the negotiating table so that we can properly defend Scotland's interests. And I would challenge all parties across this chamber to get behind us in demanding both of those things. Question number five, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to improve small business confidence. First Minister. Uh, the foundations of Scotland's economy are strong. Figures last week showed the lowest unemployment rate uh, on record, where we continue to be a top UK destination for inward investment. We're working to simplify regulation for small business, encourage innovation and entrepreneurship, and make it easier for businesses to find the finance they need to grow. Uh, we're also investing £10 million in the Local Economic Development Capital Grant Fund, which will support economic resilience and future growth across local communities, uh, including in the members region of Fife. And of course, we're delivering a highly competitive business rates package, including expanding the small business bonus scheme so that it lifts 100,000 properties out of business rates altogether. Dean Lockhart. I thank the First Minister for that response and for providing an update. We welcome the announcement earlier today of the creation of the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency, not least because it was our idea. However, <laughs> after 10 years of countless new policy initiatives from the SNP, Scotland's economy and the small business sector are still in decline. According to the Federation of Small Business last week, small business confidence in Scotland has been negative for more than five years and has been below UK levels for that time. And this reflects, according to the FSB, the fact that Scotland's economy is underperforming the rest of the UK. So I, can I ask the First Minister, why does the small business sector 
and the Scottish economy as a whole continue to underperform after 10 years of SNP government. And just to be clear, I am not talking down Scotland. I am highlighting SNP failures after 10 years in government. First Minister. Well, actually, uh, the Federation of Small Business report, which was released on the 19th of June, found that Scottish business confidence had risen for the second consecutive quarter. Uh, it also said that Brexit was having an impact in terms of increased prices for imported goods and services. So we actually see confidence increasing, but the real risk to confidence, again, being the Brexit that has been so recklessly pursued by the Tory government. So we will continue to support not just small businesses in our economy, but businesses right across our economy. Uh, we see unemployment now, as I said earlier on, at the lowest uh, level uh, on record. Uh, we see unemployment now below the UK average. Uh, we continue to take a range of initiatives from the growth fund I spoke about that Derek Mackay uh, announced the first stage of last week to the Enterprise and Skills Review that Keith Brown has been announcing today to our continued support uh, for businesses through the small business bonus. We will continue to take those actions to support our businesses and support our economy. But we all have to also be open-eyed to the big risk that is facing every business uh, across this country. And it is the unnecessary risk that has been posed on them uh, by this Tory government taking the UK not just out of the EU, but out of the single market. And the sooner the Tories wake up to that, the better. Jackie Bailey. The Federation of Small Business recent report tells us that Scottish business confidence is lower than the rest of the UK. It also suggested that business investment intentions are down compared to the previous quarter and lag the UK as a whole. And whilst other aspects of the economy may be improving, there are other challenges ahead, such as economic inactivity rising. So can the First Minister offer any explanation as to why we lag behind the UK? And now that the referendum is off the table, what action will she help take to restore business confidence in Scotland? First Minister. Well, I've already outlined the range of initiatives we're taking to support business confidence and support our economy. Um, I know why the Tories uh, refuse to accept the real risk to our business community right now. I'm not so sure why Labour uh, continue to refuse to acknowledge these risks. But what is really quite inexplicable to me is this. Uh, why was it, if Jackie Bailey is so serious about supporting the small business sector as she appears to be today, that Labour voted against uh, our budget proposals that lifted 100,000 businesses out of small business rates. That is inescapable for Labour. You know, if you, want to, if you want to support small businesses, it's not enough to come to this chamber and give them warm words. You actually have to deliver the money that supports them, not vote against that money as Labour did. Question number six, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister how the national rollout of the Baby Box scheme will improve public health and reduce health inequalities. First Minister. Uh, well, the Baby Box will help to reduce health inequalities by firstly ensuring that every family with a newborn has access to essential items needed in the first six months of a child's life. Uh, and secondly, and very importantly, the registration process for the box is designed to ensure that health professionals have the opportunity to engage with parents. Uh, and this is an essential step in encouraging women who don't currently register for antenatal services to do so and ensures that they then get appropriate support and care both for themselves and their baby. Uh, and lastly, information leaflets included in the box on issues such as safe sleeping practices, aimed to promote the well-being of babies and the inclusion of items such as a digital thermometer help parents to monitor their child's health. Monica Lennon. I thank the First Minister for her answer. Scottish Labour is a fan of the baby box scheme that originated in Finland and we wish to see its introduction in Scotland to have similar success in tackling public health challenges and health inequalities here. Some of the feedback from the pilot research published earlier this week indicated that more work needs to be done to link the box more clearly with other Scottish Government public health initiatives. This week is National Breastfeeding Week and 30 experts are calling for better support for mothers and the need for a change in the culture and conversation around breastfeeding. As the First Minister knows, rates of breastfeeding in Scotland amongst younger mothers and those from deprived areas remain too low. And as I have raised with ministers many times, the Baby Box provides a unique opportunity to improve this. 
putting a packet of nursing pads for leaky breasts and a leaflet for a breastfeeding website into the box isn't the best that Scotland can do. So I would welcome the chance to explore these issues face to face with the Minister for Children and Young People and perhaps the Public Health Minister too, because if, if we are allocating £9 million per year from the health budget, surely we all want to make the scheme as successful as possible. And that has to involve a stronger effort to push breastfeeding please, across Scotland. The question is, does the First Minister agree? First Minister. Well, so sometimes when I listen to Labour, uh, politicians talking about the baby box, it's hard to escape this conclusion that Labour are supporters and fans of the baby box when it's introduced in any other country around the world. But when it's introduced by an SNP government, they suddenly become yeah. sceptics yeah. or opponents of exactly the same initiative. And it just comes back to, I think, this difficult position that Labour often finds itself in. It's so blinkered by its dislike of the SNP that it can't even bring itself to give an unequivocal welcome to something as good as a baby box, for goodness sake. But on the specific issues, these are important issues. But, you know, Monica Lennon knows, and I'd be very happy to engage with her further in all of these issues. The baby box and uh, the, the ethos of the baby box is not just about a box of essential items, although that is very helpful to parents the length and breadth of the country. It's also about encouraging engagement uh, with antenatal services uh, by people who otherwise sometimes don't engage with antenatal services and it's through that engagement that we can then work with mothers and expectant mothers uh, to focus on things like breastfeeding and actually the advice the advice in the box is also extremely important so yes let's engage in all these things the reason we did the pilot exercise was to learn lessons from that and apply those lessons but for goodness sake can labor not just for once accept that this is a really really good thing that's why countries across the world are now doing it and get over your dislike of the SNP and just bring yourself to welcome something that's such good news for babies across Scotland Final supplementary from Fulton McGregor, who I hope will declare an interest not just as a PLO but as a brand new dad while accepting our congratulations. Thank you, President Officer, and thanks uh, to the Chamber. I'm delighted to see that every family receiving a baby box will be provided with a baby wrap, which is designed for parents to carry their babies uh, comfortably and safely. Speaking as a dad of a newborn, I'm aware that the importance of early close contact between parents and babies, which we all know contributes so much to wellbeing. Can the First Minister advise how parents' views and experiences have also helped to influence the contents of Scotland's baby box? First Minister. I congratulate Fulton McGregor on his new arrival, although perhaps get in before Kenny Gibson by uh, reminding him that he's still got some way to catch up with the presiding officer uh, on this front. <laughs> um, but the, the experience of, of parents has been uh, central to the development of, <laughs> that's me in trouble, uh, of the baby box. Uh, parents have played uh, a really big role in influencing the development of the contents of the baby box and the contents have changed uh, from the pilot to the full uh, rollout. Uh, parents, uh, for example, from low income backgrounds particularly valued the inclusion of some high cost items which are very important for the well-being of babies. Uh, I mentioned the digital ear thermometer as an example of that but there's also the room and bath water thermometer and the baby wrap that Fulton McGregor uh, mentioned. Uh, parents also asked for more than one book to be included and welcomed the inclusion of a play mat to support their children's development. So we've made sure that all of these items will be in the baby boxes that families with a newborn will begin to receive from the 15th of August this year and when that starts to happen I really hope everybody across this chamber will find it in their heart to be happy about it and welcome this good news for newborn babies right across Scotland. Thank you that concludes First Minister's questions. We now have members business in the name of Tavish Scott on the Island Games. We'll just take a few moments for members to change their seats.